Right, ladies and gents, uh, we've just had a, a brief look initially where you will be able to find this document, the, the notes that we've written on property, plant and equipment. Um, I've written similar notes for financial accounting too, except that those notes are probably about three times as long. So it's a, it, it covers a lot more uh, uh, aspects of property, plant and equipment, but that we will we'll, uh, study next year. So ladies and gents, initially we're just going to talk about property, plant and equipment in general terms. And then later on, we are going to become more specific. Then we are going to look at definitions. We are going to look at uh, disclosure requirements. We are going to look at the way that we have to uh, 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 measure the cost of inventory uh, at, at its acquisition also subsequently. So there are a lot of things that we have to look at specifically, but let us just talk about this in general terms, ladies and gentlemen. So what is property, plant and equipment? And as you can see there, property, plant and equipment has got its own international accounting standard, namely IAS 16. And the title of IAS 16 is property, plant and equipment. That is why we are using the term property, plant and equipment or PPE, ladies and gentlemen, and not motor vehicles and engines and what have you, right? So that is the name of the standard. So that is the name that we are going to be using. Now, perhaps this is a good time just to talk about standards in general. And then we are going to talk about property, plant and equipment in general. So how do the standards work? How do they fit together? We've spoken about that briefly right at the beginning of the year when we discussed the conceptual framework. But this is perhaps a good time just to revisit the concept. We know that we've got the conceptual framework for financial reporting, right? So that is a, a very generic document. So it basically applies to everything in accounting, financial accounting, except where there is a standard that specifically relates to a specific area on your uh, financial statements, right? So as soon as there is another financial reporting standard, IAS series or the IFRS series, that will then override whatever is in the conceptual framework. If there are no subsequent standards, then the conceptual framework will be the one that matters, right? In the case of property, plant and equipment, obviously the, the, the conceptual framework, all those principles still apply, but here we've got further, further definitions, further principles, further disclosure requirements, in addition to what is in the conceptual framework, but these in IAS 16 only apply to the property, plant, and equipment, no other area, right? Similarly, ladies and gents, we will have, uh, let's say, a standard that deals with intangible assets. We will have a, a standard that deals with financial instruments. We've seen a, a few months ago in financial accounting that we've got a standard that deals with inventories, IAS 2, in fact. Uh, so there are various standards relating to specific areas in your financial statements. So normally, uh, normally an accountant, especially an experienced accountant, will have a gut feel what kind of element something is or what kind of area it belongs in the financial statements. But if the accountant does not, then the accountant can always go to the conceptual framework as well as the particular IASs and IFRSs and use that as guidance to find out where does an item belong. <clears throat> A little bit later today, when we get to the specifics, we are going to discuss that in more detail. We will see that in order for something to be property, plant and equipment, it must first and foremost comply with the definition of an asset. If it's not an asset, then it cannot be property, plant and equipment either. So once we've determined that something is an asset, then subsequently we have to go and determine which kind of asset. 
Is this now property planting equipment? Is it an intangible asset? <clears throat> is it inventories? Is it a biological asset? Uh, is it an intangible asset? Where does it belong? And that is where the definitions, the further definitions that we find in the standards come into play. Right, ladies and gentlemen, so now let's talk about property plant and equipment in general. Uh, in the notes, I've, I've just uh, put a little discussion there. We are going to look at all of these aspects in more detail a little bit later. But as you can see, the property plant and equipment refers to physical or tangible assets, right? So if it's not a physical asset or tangible, in other words, you cannot touch it, you cannot uh, feel it, you cannot kick it, you cannot lick it, then it cannot be property plant and equipment. So it has to be physical. It must have physical substance, in other words, tangible, which we'll see is part of the definition of property, plant, and equipment. Then as we'll see later, ladies and gentlemen, generally, property, plant, and equipment assists the business in actually running the business. For instance, your motor vehicles, part of them might be your delivery vehicle. So it assists you in delivering your inventories, your merchandise to your customers, or it might assist you in, in fetching raw materials from your suppliers, right? If you are a manufacturing concern, your machinery and plant will assist the business in producing a product that they can sell, right? So in general terms, your property, plant and equipment is essential for your business to operate. When we get to the definition, we'll see they specify three tip, well, three very specific kinds of activities when it comes to uh, property, plant, and equipment. So generally, ladies and gentlemen, it is used to generate economic benefits for the business. And then also part of the definition, which we'll see later on, it must be used over more than one financial accounting period. If it is going to be used uh, uh, in less than one financial accounting period, it also does not qualify as property, plant and equipment, but we will discuss that a little bit later on. Now, before we go any further, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to type a few things for me. So uh, perhaps you can just type a few examples, a few examples of what you will see as property, plant and equipment. It can, add, it can either be specific items or categories of property, plant and equipment. Just a few thoughts from your side, please. There we go, vehicle or vehicles. Yes, vehicles is a typical one. We've just mentioned delivery vehicles or even uh, perhaps the, the, the uh, CEO's uh, uh, company car, land and buildings, there's another one, there we go, equipment, computers, factory and storage units, all brilliant, brilliant examples, machinery, there we go, building, thank you so much for all those answers, you are all spot on, so you can see all of those are physical items, all of those assist you in running the business or makes the operation of the business possible. And you can also see that all of those will be used during more than one accounting period. So all of those examples you've given there uh, are exactly in accordance with the definition of property, plant and equipment, spot on. Right, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, we just mentioned a few examples as well. Like you have, like you have just done machinery, for instance, that could be used to manufacture your inventory. In other words, if you are a, a manufacturing kind of company, you will have machinery and plant uh, or some some kind of equipment. If you are if you have a garden services, if you're a garden services business, then uh, equipment such as your lawn mowers and your your your, your uh, grass cutters and things like that will be part of your property plant and equipment. We'll also see later on. Uh, uh, I think somebody mentioned their storage units. That is a very good example of something that could be rented out. 
when we get to the definition, we'll talk about this uh, in, 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 in more detail. Right. So a lot of you also mentioned buildings there and computer equipment. That is for administration purposes. Right. So here yeah, we're just mentioning a, a few examples. It's obviously not a not a complete list. There could be other other examples, vehicles, office furniture. Uh, equipment, either office equipment or factory equipment, machinery, buildings, land, either developed land or, 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 or uh, investment property and so forth, right? So those are just uh, uh, a few examples, ladies and gentlemen. This paragraph I've just left in, uh, but we are not really going to discuss that in financial accounting one, uh, but but it is something that we will that we must just keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that sometimes sometimes if a business is going to change their business activities, they might want to sell those assets, right, uh, in order to buy new non-current assets, such as uh, property, plant, and equipment is uh, part of non-current assets, uh, and then in that intervening period it might have to be taken out of your non-current assets because you intend to sell them in the short term and be taken to current assets. But anyway, we'll discuss that in more detail in financial accounting too. Now we are going to start looking at things in more detail, ladies and gentlemen. So this is where it now comes to studying, right? The first kind, the first set of this definitions here come from the conceptual framework, right? So you already know that from the beginning of the year. So as we've said earlier, before something can qualify, before it is able to qualify as property, plant and equipment, it must first and foremost be an asset, right? So therefore we've got to revisit the asset definition again. Um, Enrique, um, yes, uh, I, 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 I see that question there. I was before I lost my my browser. I was going to go back to the to the um, to that folder, the property, plant, and equipment topic folder, because the chapters are mentioned there. It's not exactly the same chapter in the in the seventh or in the, as it is in the eighth edition, but it is mentioned there. So I'm going to probably go back there. Let's go back there now. Let's go back there now, and then I'll come back to, to this document. Hopefully, I won't lose my, my old browser again. Because that was the original intention. Just to answer on Rick's question there. Okay, so let us go to our content per topic. Sorry that I'm that I'm jumping around there, ladies and gents. Like I say, that was the initial intention before I so clumsily closed my my browser. Right. So under our content per topic, if we go down to topic eleven, property, plant, and equipment. Let us just go there again. Right, there you will see that is what the idea was, ladies and gentlemen, in the prescribed textbooks. If you are using uh, the eighth edition, it's in chapter 13. By the way, just mentioning that um, uh, there will be an, a ninth edition available probably next year. Um, I've already I've already received an email from, from Jutas um, whether I'm interested in reviewing and improving the textbook. There's a little bit of a payment involved in that, but I don't think I will have time for that. But in any way, 8th edition is chapter 13, and in the 7th edition it is chapter 14, right? So that is where you can find it. Let's also have a brief overview um, of what we are going to be looking at, we, or what we must be able to do at the very least once we are done with this topic. We should be able to calculate and account for depreciation of non-current assets over the assets life cycle. So we'll talk all about that. Some of you who have had uh, accounting at school will know what all of that is. But if you don't at this stage, do not worry. We are going to discuss that in depth. Also to account for the disposal of non-current assets in the general journal and in the ledger accounts. 
also to calculate a profit or loss with a disposal or on the disposal of assets and also to prepare the property plant and equipment note to the financial statement. So we are going to do all of that, ladies and gentlemen, but also a lot more because in order to be able to do that, there's a lot of other things that you must also be able to do. For instance, you must be able to calculate the cost the cost of the asset upon acquisition. You must know how to record the acquisition. Obviously, like you see there, you must be able to record the disposal. But before you dispose it, you must first have acquired it, right? So we're going to start at the beginning where we actually record the acquisition. So there, there's a lot more in that than we disclose all that, that, that is mentioned there. But that ultimately is what, what, uh, what our goals are, right? Okay, so let us just go back to the notes now. So as we've said, ladies and gentlemen, before, uh, any item can be seen as property, plant and equipment. It must first and foremost be an asset. So we must still know the definition of an asset. And this comes from the conceptual framework for financial uh, reporting, right? So what is an asset? We've, we've taken that definition, which is one, one sentence, and we've broken it up into certain components. We said it must be a present economic resource controlled by the entity, which results from past events, right? That you remember from the first semester, uh, first term, in fact, already, right? And then we've also said, what does uh, the conceptual framework define an economic resource as? They say an economic resource is a right that has the potential to produce economic benefits. Now, next year, when you do internal auditing too, You'll see uh, there's, there's, there's uh, certain assertions, certain statements that people, that accountants make in the financial statements. We call them assertions, which they claim to be the truth. Uh, and if they, if, if, if they disclose property, plant and equipment or any other asset, they must have the rights to that asset. So that, that sort of uh, uh, combines with the definition or it, or it, it, it closely, closely fits in with the definition of an asset, the term rights, and in the case of, of liabilities, obligations when it comes to auditing. Rightly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so this is where we just confirmed that to be classified as property, plant and equipment, the, the, that particular asset that you want to record, that you want to recognize, must therefore comply with two definitions. First of all, the asset definition, which comes from the conceptual framework, but then secondly, the definition for property, plant and equipment itself, which comes from IAS 16. So this is what, uh, where I mentioned earlier, I just want to go through the process of, of, of determining what kind of asset or liability or what kind of element uh, something turns out to be. So first of all, if we want to recognize an item that we've, that we've just acquired, right? Then we first got to visit the conceptual framework. Then we've got to first determine what kind of element is it? Is it an asset? Is it a liability? Is it income? Is it an expense? Or is it equity, right? Once we've determined that, then we can go to the subsequent IFRS is international financial reporting standards, if there, if there is any uh, on that particular item. And then we can see where does it fit in? Does it fit in under inventories? Does it fit in under property, plant and equipment? Does it fit in under intangible assets? Or where does it fit in? Right. If we've determined that it's a liability, then we're going to visit some other uh, uh, international financial reporting standards to see which kind of liability that is. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so now this is a definition that we've got to know and we've got to understand and we also have to apply, right? 
So again, that definition has been broken up into three main components, right? And then that second one is broken up into three subcomponents. So let us analyze it, let us discuss it. During this discussion, ladies and gentlemen, if you've got any questions, you are most welcome to ask them. You can ask them in person, ladies and gents. You can type them in the chat. I also have my eye on the chat. I know Ms. Morris also has. So um, we, will, we will hopefully answer all your questions during this discussion. As we've seen earlier, the first part, uh, let, let's maybe read the definition because once again, it's one sentence and then we break it down into its components. So from IAS 16, the definition of property, plant and equipment reads as follows. Property, plant and equipment is a tangible item which is held or used in the production or supply of goods or services or for rental to others or for administration purposes and are expected to be used during more than one period. That is exactly the sentence as it stands in IAS 16. But now let's break it down in the most important components uh, that is mentioned in that sentence. So firstly, it is a tangible item, right? It is a tangible item. In other words, it has physical form. As I said tongue in cheek, you can see it, you can kick it, you can lick it, you can kiss it, you can, you can touch it. That is the, the point, right? So it's a physical item. Uh, if it's not a physical item, ladies and gentlemen, then it cannot qualify as property, plant and equipment. I can just give you two, perhaps, two examples of, of, of non-current assets that are not, not tangible, but they are still part of your non-current assets, even though not part of property, plant and equipment. One typical example is, for instance, patent rights, patent rights or copyrights, right? Copyrights uh, means that, that, that the intellectual property of the person who created that uh, document or that, that song, for that matter, they, they have the intellectual property over it, right? And therefore, they must be remunerated if somebody else makes use of it, right? So when it comes to copyrights or patent rights, that will fall under a different IAS uh, called intangible assets. Another example of, of, of a non-current asset that is not tangible is, for instance, um, let's say a fixed deposit. If you've got a two-year fixed deposit at the bank, right? Uh, in other words, it's, it's, you cannot access it within one year, so it's a non-current asset, but you cannot actually see or touch the account itself, right? That is also not tangible. But that then is not an intangible asset because the intangible asset definition excludes financial assets or anything of a financial nature. But that will then fall under a different IAS which deals with financial instruments and financial assets, right? But when it comes to property, plant and equipment, it must be tangible. Then, ladies and gentlemen, it must be used for one of three purposes. One of three purposes. Doesn't need to be all three as long as it is one of them. Let's look at them. In the production or supply of goods. Let's maybe stop there. So if it is used, that particular property, plant and equipment, if it is used in the production or supply of goods, give me an example of or two. What that would, what that could relate to, please. If you can type that for us, please. You've mentioned some of that already. It, I can actually see it there <laughs> on the chat box, but I just want to see whether we are on the same page with this. Machinery. Thank you, Lucanio. Exactly. Thank you, Mercedes. Yes. Exactly. Thank you, Sibu Sisu. Machinery, manufacturing machinery, right? So that will typically be uh, uh, a property, plant and equipment item or items or, or, or category of items, machinery, uh, that, that, that assists the company uh, in, in operating the business by producing or supplying goods that are going to be sold. Let's stay with that same one. 
uh, that that same bullet. So in the production or supply of services, maybe give me two or three examples there. What kind of property, plant, and equipment can be used in the supply of services? We've actually mentioned a, a few a little bit earlier. You are welcome to take a few guesses there. Computers, uh, so that's a good suggestion. It all depends what you do with the computers. If, if you use your computers, let's say to, uh, if you're a publishing company, if you're a publishing company and you use the computers to produce books or magazines, then you are quite correct, right? Uh, but computers generally, like I say, it all depends what it's being used for. Computers normally, in most businesses, have a slightly different uh, 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 use or intention. Lawnmower, thank you, Luke Kanyu. That's the one that we also mentioned a little bit earlier. If you if your business is garden services, a lawnmower, a lawnmower would be uh, would be would be an asset that you use in the production or supply of a service. Maybe one or two more, ladies and gents. Let's say you, you, you uh, supply cakes and, 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 and uh, cookies and things like that to, to uh, other retail stores. Sika, that's also a good suggestion, but normally chairs will not. Again, it depends what you use it for, but normally that will. It could be. It could be if you, for instance, let, let's put it this way: if you have a if you have a private university or a private college, right, and you use the chairs for your students to sit in, then you're quite correct, in Sika. Then you are actually using the chairs for for. Uh, uh, for supplying a service, that is quite correct. But if you use the chairs just as office equipment where your where your uh, staff sit on, then it will not be used in the, in the supply of services. But if you are using it to to lecture people, then it is. Sibusisu, there you go. If you are using the computers at an internet cafe, that is a perfect example of when it when computers are actually uh, used in the production or supply of a service. Perfect, perfect. That is a very good example. Laundry machines, that's another good one, Look, can you? If you've got a, a laundromat business, right, your laundry machines, in other words, the washing machines and the tumble dryers, they will assist you in supplying a service, right? Mercedes, we're going to get to that one next. We're going to get to that one next. Okay, I think we've got enough examples. So you get the idea that the the, the asset uh, to be all in in order to be classified as property, plant, and equipment, uh, to, if it complies with that first bullet under paragraph or our paragraph two, uh, then it must be used to supply goods or produce goods, or it must be used to 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 supply or produce services that 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 generates services income for that particular business. Okay, then secondly, ladies and gentlemen, and like I say, remember that it only needs to comply with one of these, not all three. Secondly, it could be used for rental to others, for rental to others. So if you can perhaps uh, uh, type one or two ideas for us there, what is typically for rental, an asset that is held for rental to others? Mercedes, that is where your suggestion comes in. Buildings for renting, right. It can either be residential. Thank you, Zekoda. Maybe a tent. Yes, if you rent out uh, camping equipment, uh, property, houses, guest houses, con uh, uh, construction machinery can be rented out. Vehicles, we've got companies that do nothing other than renting out vehicles such as Hertz and Avis. Uh, 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 Europe car, the Alamo, and so forth. Right, vehicles. That's all good, good, good suggestions. So if you rent it out to others, 
that generates your income. In other words, your main source of revenue is rental income. Uh, in the case of buildings, uh, quite a few of you mentioned buildings there. Yes, it could be residential buildings. It, it could be industrial buildings. If you receive rent, lease or rental income, then that is your main source of revenue. And therefore, that asset produces that main source of revenue, which means that it is part of your property, plant and equipment. Right, ladies and gentlemen, then the third possibility, one or two of you mentioned that a little bit earlier, it could be an asset that does not produce the goods or services. You are not renting it out to others, but it is crucial for you to be able to run the business. And that is what they mentioned there in the third bullet, or it could be held for administration purposes, right? Administration purposes. So this is where uh, many of the examples that you've that you've mentioned earlier, uh, let's just run through a few of them. If you are using the computers uh, at an internet cafe, as someone suggested, then obviously it does supply a service. If you're only using, thank you for those suggestions, yes, uh, the storage space, that, that is part of, of rental to others. Uh, look, can you, if, if you are if you are renting out storage space, then it falls under the second one. So you, you're, in other words, renting out a storage unit or storage space to someone. So, so there are quite a number of, of, of companies. You see them. Uh, I, I actually see them when I when I drive out to Wellington. I see quite a lot of them on the on the back roads of of of, of Durbanville uh, and and um, what's it called? Um, Oh, I forget the name of that farm, but there's there's, there's a farm. Uh, um, oh, can't can't remember, but it's just uh, it's part of the farm premises. I forget now. But anyway, uh, so so those those storage units that get rented out, that's part of the second bullet. Uh, thank you, Mr. X uh, Sitole. Yes, uh, storage quickly. Yes, that is for renting out for administration purposes. Uh, if, like you said earlier, if you're using the chairs in a lecture theater, then you are using the chairs to supply a service. But if you are using the chairs simply in the office for your administrators, for your secretaries, and for your uh, CEO, and what have you, then it's clearly only for administration purposes. Similarly, the desks, the office desks. The SCBC has got a lot of, lot of suggestions there. Printers, yes. Scanners, yes furniture and equipment right such as storage cabinets those filing cabinets those are all items that are used over more than one accounting period they are tangible uh, and they they are used for administration purposes right so your printers and your computers and your scanners and your laptops and your chairs and your desks and your filing cabinets uh, that are simply used for administration purposes will still be part of property, plant, and equipment because you use them for administrative purposes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so those are the three kinds of things that it must be used for in order to qualify as property, plant, and equipment. Then a little bit of a tricky one. The last one, it is expected to be used during more than one period. Um, IAS 16 doesn't underline the word period. I underlined it uh, because it needs a little bit of a discussion. What they are meaning, what they are referring to there is that that specific asset must be used during more than one financial accounting period. Now, students, I know that very often you associate that with it must be used with uh, for longer than a year. But that is not necessarily the case. It doesn't necessarily have to be used more than one calendar year. It must just be used during more than one financial accounting period. I'm going to give you an example and hopefully this explains it because I'm sure it sounds a little bit Greek to you. Unless you are Greek, then it sounds uh, Irish to you or whatever. Uh, what it means, ladies and gents, let's use an example. 
let's say you are acquiring an asset right it is tangible you are going to use it in the production or supply of goods or services or for rental to others or administration purposes but you only going to, you only intend to use it for nine months you only intend to use it for nine months now this is a tricky question you can only you only need to say yes or no can that conceivably ever be seen as property plant and equipment yes or no Yes, I like that, Cebu Sisu. Yes, it can. I think everybody's a little bit wary of this one. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Simni Kiwi. Thank you, Nimadzadza. You all say yes, and you are correct as well. It is possible. Thank you, Ayabonga. If you can touch it, if you can feel it, let me give you an example where this can be possible. Let's say, for instance, your financial year ends on the 30th 31st of december let's make it easier let's make it at the end of the year so your financial year ends on the 31st of december you purchase an asset that complies with all of the rest of the definition for property plant and equipment but you only acquire that that specific asset on the 1st of october you only acquire it on the 1st of October for that year, but you intend to use it for nine months. During how many months are you going to use that during this current financial year in which you have acquired it? If you can type that for me, if you bought it on the 1st of October. Three months. Thank you, Sibu Sisu. Thank you, thank you everyone. There's a lot of answers now. Correct, you're going to use it October, November and December, but then you haven't finished using it. For how many months in the next financial year are you still going to use it? Six, thank you, Enrique. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, many quick answers there and you're all correct. So ladies and gentlemen, the question here is, even though we are only going to use it on fire, thank you, Ms. Morris, they are, they are. Uh, even though we're only going to use it for a total of nine months, the fact is that that nine months is not in one financial accounting period. The first three months falls in one financial accounting period, and the second six months, or the other six months, uh, uh, fall in the next financial accounting period so therefore it needs to be capitalized as an asset and because it complies with all of the other components of this definition it means it will be classified as property plant and equipment we are going to talk uh, about depreciation later today we're going to talk about depreciable amounts and all sorts of terms but the fact remains ladies and gentlemen you are consuming the useful life of that specific asset over more than one financial accounting period, which means that the portion of its depreciable amount that you consume during this first financial year during those three months must be written off this year, and the portion of the depreciable amount that you are going to consume during the next year for the other six months must be written off in the next year. So there must be a carrying amount that's another term we're going to talk about later so there must be a carrying amount in your books of account at the end of this financial year that reflects that you are still owning that asset and that it still has future economic benefits for us in the next financial year but so that is uh, i know i made a long song and dance of it but it is quite important that we get it clear in our heads that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's more than a year and i know that that uh, that that students sometimes uh, uh, have a little bit of difficulty getting their heads around that but i think we're all clear on that now uh Cibusiso. 
What if it is in the same financial accounting period? How will you record it considering there is depreciation? Uh, very good question, that's uh, Cebu CISO. Let me, let me give you the right way, the correct way to do it, and then I'll give you the way that accountants sometimes do it. So perhaps I shouldn't even mention the way that accountants sometimes do it. The correct way of doing it, the correct way of doing it, uh, especially, especially if you are a listed company, if you have to drop uh, interim financial statements, the correct way would to do it the normal way. In other words, you capitalize the cost and you write off the depreciation over the nine months, even though it falls within one financial accounting period, right? Because then, uh, then especially, like I say, if it's a listed company which has to draw up uh, interim financial statements, but also if it's a large concern, very often the management requires monthly statements, monthly management accounting statements, right? So then it will reflect a better picture, right? So that is definitely the correct way of doing so. Um, I would always, always recommend that, uh, especially if you have to drop monthly financial statements, even though it's only for internal use. But the fact is you want to present a good or, or a more accurate financial position as well as as the results of the operations during the course of that year so that will be the correct way to do it but i do also know that sometimes especially if the amount is is, is fairly immaterial i know that that uh, very often uh, they simply write off the whole the, the whole cost of the asset right at the beginning of the year especially if it's not going to have a residual value but i should probably not have even said that because that is bad practice that is bad practice it's just that i know some do but the correct way to, it would be to do it the normal way that we are going to be discussing later on today and next week and probably the week after that as well you're welcome Sibu sisu okay so the correct way is to do it the right way <laughs> or to do it the normal way right ladies and gents um so let us just talk about ias 16 in general and then we are going to look at uh, some specifics so the standard says that when it comes to property plant and equipment what what must we do there are a lot of things that must be done but the first thing that we've got that comes to mind is how to determine how it is initially measured how do we determine its cost and we are going to look at at, at a class example or a class exercise uh, possibly not today but next week but we are going to look at the at the at the requirements of the initial measurement today also how is it subsequently measured in other words after the date of the acquisition and then normally that refers to either when you drop financial statements or when you dispose of it right that brings into play what we refer to as depreciation and here you can make a note i think we mentioned it a little bit later again what is depreciation just in case we do not mention it later on i think we do but i can't remember now perhaps you can just make a note ladies and gentlemen this is actually how depreciation is defined in ias 16 depreciation is if you want to make a note there uh, your own notes depreciation is a systematic allocation i guess it's a good idea to to make the note because this is really how it is described and very often later on students will will ask now what is depreciation and why is why does it differ from impairment losses which we'll only do next year in financial accounting too but anyway depreciation is a systematic allocation of an asset's depreciable amount. All those words are there. I'm just putting it in a different order, right? The order that it is mentioned in IAS 16. So depreciation is a systematic allocation of an asset's depreciable amount over its useful life. So that is a mouthful. So there's a lot of terms that we will that we will have to go and discuss around that. But we'll get to that step by step, ladies and gentlemen. We've already mentioned this, ladies and gents, uh, that 
in order for for an item to comply uh, to be to actually uh, uh, qualify to be regarded as property plant and equipment it must meet the definition criteria of an asset which we've mentioned earlier the definition of property plant and equipment itself but also before we actually record it in our books of account it must also comply with the recognition criteria right now you'll remember in the conceptual framework i don't want to display that bottom part yet <laughs> let me just hide that when we discussed the, the conceptual framework, we saw that there are certain defin, uh, definition criteria for but then also recognition criteria. And then IAS 16 goes a little bit further and it also has its own recognition criteria. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know this is a little bit of a trick question, uh, but when it came to, to the conceptual framework, conceptual framework. We said that your financial statement to you, Morris, can you just check there's somebody's microphone? Um, I'm not to do that, sir. Uh, okay. uh, there are certain characteristics, certain characteristics that fun that makes financial statements usable. So we said that for financial statements to be uh, of use to the users of the financial statements, there are certain attributes or characteristics that it must comply with. And then we distinguished between two overall characteristics. Who wants to try and uh, uh, type that for us? I know they are very long words, so I'll give you a little while to type them, 30 seconds or so. Can you remember what are those characteristics that we mentioned in the conceptual framework? Thank you, Ms. Morris. I think you've you've muted the the culprit. Okay, I'm not going to, to, to waste too much time on that, ladies and gentlemen. Those were your, your, your fundamental qualitative characteristics and your enhancing qualitative characteristics, right? You remember that? And then I, uh, sorry, the conceptual framework went further. They said that uh, your recognition criteria before you actually recognize or record an item in your books of account, you must make sure that it at least complies with the fundamental qualitative characteristics, the fundamental qualitative characteristics. Now, can you remember what were those two fundamental qualitative, the, the two fundamental qualitative characteristics? Thank you, Zila. You've got some of the enhancing qualitative characteristics there. The relevance is one, yes. Relevance is one of the fundamental qualitative characteristics. What was the other one? Faithful representation. Thank you, Zila. You have no idea how much you've just impressed me. <laughs> that is very, very good. Right, so your fundamental qualitative characteristics were relevance, it must be relevant, in, and it must be a faithful representation of what really, truly happened within the business during that period, right? And then the, uh, the conceptual framework said, before you recognize anything, it must comply with those two criteria. So that is exactly your, the, the, the recognition criteria that they are referring to here, the ones that come from your, from the conceptual framework, right? So the recognition criteria, the ones from the conceptual framework, is that the items before you recognize it, you must make sure that it provides relevant information and it would be a faithful representation of the phenomena it purports to present. That sounds very fancy, but it basically just means that it's a true reflection of what really happened within that business when it comes to its results, its operations, uh, its cash flows, as well as its financial position. 
Then IAS 16, so those apply to, to, to property, plant, and equipment as well. But then IAS 16 goes a little bit further, and they provide us with additional recognition criteria that then, therefore, only apply to property, plant, and equipment, not any other kind of element. And those two are the following, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it comes from paragraph 7 of IAS 16. Before you recognize it, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once it complies with the definition criteria of an asset as well as the definition criteria of property, plant, and equipment, before you recognize it, you must consider the following. Firstly, it should be probable, and that is the 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 that is why we've bolded that right that is important word probable in other words the likelihood must be very high so it must be probable that there will be an inflow of future economic benefits to the entity as a result of that specific asset so because you are owning that asset or because you have the right over the asset it will cause or it will result in the inflow of future economic benefits. If it doesn't, then you should actually not even recognize it. Right. Secondly, the cost of the asset, and later on when we're not talking uh, 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 initial cost, when we talk about subsequent measurement, you can even say the cost or the value of the asset must be measured reliably right so you must have a reliable ma manner or fashion in which you can measure it in other words in which you can quantify it if you cannot you, you can imagine for yourself if you do not know what the cost of the of the item is how are you going to record it because you can't record something that you don't know about right so it must at least then also have a cost that can be measured reliably Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, then uh, just a few few uh, uh, thoughts that we've got here before we actually go and look at initial measurement. Uh, just a few of the terms that we are using that we must that we must remember and that we must understand. We have already mentioned earlier about a useful life, right? We when we looked at the definition of depreciation, we said that uh, the the it is the systematic allocation of the depreciable amount of that asset over its useful life. Now, what is meant by the useful life, ladies and gentlemen? Now, we'll see later on there are various methods of depreciation. Uh, two of the methods uh, uh, is based on, on, on time, and the other method is based on capacity. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in detail in the future, right? Uh, but the fact remains, when it comes to the useful life, it means for how long, how long either in terms of months or years or its capacity, are we as a business intending to use that specific asset, right? Let's say, let's say, uh, I'm just going to ask you a question or two here, here ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so you can you can just type in the chat for me a few answers there. Let's say, for instance, that you know that this particular, let's say, motor vehicle, this particular motor vehicle has got a potential lifetime of at least 10 years, if not more. This, this motor vehicle can keep on going for 10 years, maybe 12 years, maybe 15 years, maybe 20 years. Who knows if it's well maintained? But you as a business, your intention is to only use it for five years and then replace it with another new vehicle. What is the useful life for that vehicle for you as a business? If you can type for me, please. Five years. Thank you, Sibu Sisu. Thank you, Kelsey. Exactly. Then it is five years so what that basically means your intention is to use it for five years at the end of the five year period it still has got some use so you will be able to actually sell it 
to some other private person or some other business or some company and they can use it further they can use it for another five years possibly right so the fact remains the useful life doesn't necessarily mean the total economic uh, the, the, the the total uh, economic useful life but only the useful life for you as a business how long do you intend to use it right so that is important for us to to grasp right we've also uh, i think once or twice mentioned the, the the term residual value now perhaps you can just make a few notes there ladies and gentlemen the term residual value is the official term being used in ias 16 but very often accountants and other people also refer to that as the so-called scrap value scrap value or salvage value so those are two alternative terms uh, but but the official term is the residual value so what is the residual value or salvage value uh, or scrap value if you wish that is what we estimate what we estimate we will be able to sell the asset for at the end of its useful life so if we if we uh if we take that vehicle that we've just used as an example of useful life, if we say that vehicle can possibly last uh, for 12 or 15 or even 20 years, but we only going to use it for five years, the residual value is what do we as a business, what do we expect today? What do we expect today that we will be able to sell it for in five years time right so obviously the the effect of of, of time uh, on money must also be be taken into account so residual value is what do we expect to be able to sell it for at the end of the time that we are going to use it so what will that 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 person that's going to purchase it from us be willing to buy it for which means ladies and gentlemen and here you can please make a note i'm actually sorry that i haven't written it in here i know I, it, it's it's later on in the notes but this is a good good place to also discuss it which brings us to the term we've just mentioned it a little bit earlier of depreciable amount depreciable amount so clearly ladies and gentlemen the depreciable amount is the value that you as a business expect to consume by using that specific asset right which portion of the value of the asset do we intend to consume during the course of that five-year period which means ladies and gentlemen that your depreciable amount will be what how are you going to determine the depreciable amount it is going to be your cost your initial measurement of cost less what if you can type for me an idea there your cost less what will give you the amount that you believe you are going to consume of the cost going to be the cost what will remain after we've used it ladies and gentlemen the term that we see in front of us in this case we, we we're going to come back to accumulated depreciation that determines thank you Lisol. that is the one i'm looking for uh the the this all the salvage value salvage values Zile. thank you Thank you, uh, Mr. Sitole, as well, residual value. We're going to come back to accumulated depreciation later on, ladies and gents, when we are looking at, 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 at carrying amounts, right? We're not looking at carrying amounts yet. We just now want to see what, what is the amount that we have to write off. So the difference between the cost and the residual value therefore provides us with the amount that we believe we're going to consume of the cost and that in turn ladies and gentlemen is the amount that we have to depreciate over the 
useful lifetime right so the amount that we are going to consume the difference between the cost and the residual value that will remain of the cost at the end of the useful life that is what we are going to consume of its value which means that is what we need to depreciate over that five year period does that make sense i hope so Okay, right, ladies and gentlemen. So now let's just have a look at some some typical expenses that 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 are uh, involved when it comes to property, plant, and equipment, and we'll discuss them as well. Uh, certain certain uh, expenses. Let, let's maybe just talk about depreciation, and then we'll talk about other kinds of expenses. So depreciation itself, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that that can be used. That can be calculated in two ways, and we'll discuss the two ways and the three methods later on. It can either be spread over a certain number of accounting periods, such as five years in the, in the example that we've just used, or it can be spread over the, the, the assets capacity. Now, when it comes to the methods of, of, of calculating depreciation, IAS 16 provides for three methods. The first two methods deals with the time, the time that we are going to be using the, the asset, right? So the useful life that we have determined. And the third one deals with the capacity. And we're going to, I know it, it is a little bit strange and Greek at the moment, but we are going to discuss all of these in detail over the next few weeks, right? So the three methods, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to, to look at all three me methods individually. We're going to discuss them. We're going to understand them entirely by the time we're done with the discussion. So don't worry if it looks a little bit foreign to you at the moment. It will be very familiar to you in a few weeks' time. So the three methods, ladies and gentlemen, are the straight line method. The straight line method that basically comes down to you are going to uh, uh, write off an equal amount of depreciation over each financial accounting period. That is the straight line method, an equal amount over the whole uh, expected useful lifetime. Then we get the diminishing balance method. I think uh, some accountants sometimes just call it the, uh, what do they sometimes call it? There is another term, but the official term in IAS 16 is the diminishing balance method. Perhaps some of you have heard the other term. I, I, I just can't remember it now at the moment. It must be old age. But anyway, if you don't remember the other term, then it's a good thing. Then we use the official term. And then the other one, the third one, doesn't take time into account. It takes capacity into account. So let's maybe just talk about the diminishing balance method. That is where initially you are going to write off a larger amount in depreciation. And each subsequent year, the depreciation will become a little bit less than in the previous years. Uh, in the case of a motor vehicle, this diminishing balance method is actually quite appropriate to a motor vehicle or motor vehicles in general. As we know, as soon as we purchase a new motor vehicle, that very same day, it suddenly is not new anymore. It's now a second-hand motor vehicle, right? So the minute somebody purchases a motor vehicle, it actually loses a substantial amount of its value overnight. But then over the rest of the term, it does not lose as much right so so right up front when 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 you start the depreciation uh, process you will write off quite a substantial number uh, amount for depreciation but it will become progressively less as the years go on the units of production method does not take time into account it takes into account the capacity or the potential that that something has 
for a company, right? So that will normally be more mostly applicable to plant and machinery, something that is used in production. If it's not used in production of goods, then really you cannot apply the units of production method. By the way, you can just make a little note there, ladies and gentlemen. There are a few alternative terms for that. They also sometimes refer to it as the usage method. U-S-A-G-E, the usage method. Maybe I can just type that there. So sometimes they refer to that as the usage method. Uh, but but uh, other other possible names for the same thing is the the units of production method, as it is called in IAS 16. And I actually, the first time I encountered it many, many, many years ago, we called it the, in the old IAS 16, uh, we called it the sum of digits method, in fact. Now, sometimes I refer it as the sum of units method, but many, many, many moons ago, it was also referred to the sum of digits method. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, are you, are you fairly happy with those terms? If you can just say yes or no, is there anything that we need to go over again? Obviously, when we get to the examples, uh, much of this will become a lot clearer. Happy so far? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you all. We do. Okay, there's, there's seems to be consensus that we're all on the same page at this stage. But anyway, if there's something that you want to ask, as you know, as always, you are most welcome. Right, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to start about talking about initial costs when, when we acquire the asset, right? A few thoughts. These are just general thoughts, ladies and gentlemen, and then later on, we're going to make it more official. Then we are going to make it more formal. So when it comes to the initial cost, in other words, when we acquire the asset, when we buy the asset, right? How are we initially going to recognize it? Normally, if it is, or not normally, always, if it is regarded as property, plant, and equipment, it should be capitalized. I did mention, unfortunately, earlier that some accountants have a bad habit that if it's going to be only used within one accounting period, then they do not even capitalize it, but that is really very bad practice. So it should be capitalized, which means we have to go and determine the cost. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is probably a good time to take a few notes again. How do we do this the cost? Yes, Ms. Morris. Interrupt. Sibasiso has a question. I'll just read it. So, sorry, to my understanding, straight line is on cost thing, diminishing balance is on opening balance. What is the unit method calculated on? A very good question there. Was it Sibusiso? I don't see it yes, now. Yes, it was Sibusiso. Oh, thank you. A uh, very good question that we are going to discuss that. Uh, oh, now I see this, right? I was looking up <laughs> at, at the top, but I see it's at the bottom there. Uh, Sibu Sisa, we're going to talk about all of that. Uh, your understanding is basically correct, but let us maybe just discuss it now while the question is on the table. When it comes to the straight line method, when it comes to the straight line method, we are going to determine before we even depreciate it, before we calculate depreciation, we are firstly going to calculate the, who wants to type for me there, what term did we use? Before we calculate depreciation in the case of the straight line method, we are first going to calculate something else. The depreciable amount, right? Then we are first going to calculate the depreciable amount. At what? Right. What is the depreciable amount? We have discussed a little bit earlier. If somebody can type for us, then how do we calculate the depreciable amount? In the case of the straight line method, it is, in other words, the amount that we're going to consume. 
cost less residual value. Thank you, Mbali. Absolutely spot on. Right. So the cost. Thank you, the, uh, Lucille, as well. Uh, everyone else. Okay. So it is the cost less the residual value. In the case, um, let me just see that question again. In the case of the uh, the sum of units or the usage method, very similar, very similar, right? In the case of CBCSU and everyone else students, in the case of the usage method, the same happens. You are first going to determine how much of the value or cost of the item you are going to consume over the useful lifetime. So again, ladies and gentlemen, in the case of the usage method, you are going to calculate the depreciable amount, right? You're going to calculate the depreciable amount, the depreciable amount again being the cost less the residual value. How you then apply it when you calculate depreciation differs between the two, and we're going to actually do examples of those next week, right? So then we'll see how we do the actual depreciation for each of them, because obviously in the case of the straight line method, you use time as, you, as, your, as your criterion, and in the case of the sum of units method or the usage method, you do not. You only use the capacity, the, the number of units that this machine can possibly produce over that useful lifetime as your criterion. Okay, so that's where the difference comes in. But determining its depreciable amount is identical. When it comes to the diminishing balance method, there it is different. There you do not, there you do not calculate a depreciable amount up front. So there you do not take the cost less the residual value as the depreciable amount. There, ladies and gentlemen, what happens there? Uh, yes, it is. Mkisani, it is. It is available. Um, it is under that folder. Yes, thank you, Ms. Morris. Uh, in the case of the, where were we now? In the case of the diminishing balance method, right? There you do not upfront calculate the depreciable amount. Why? Because the, 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 the whole method, the whole way that the diminishing balance method works, it provides you with an ongoing a continuous estimate of the residual value at any point in time. So there, in the first year of acquisition, CBC and everyone else, when you are using the diminishing balance method in the first year of acquisition, right, simply your cost will be the depreciable amount. So you're only going to take your cost and then apply a certain percentage uh, for depreciation on the cost. And then in each subsequent year, the next year, you are going to use the carrying amount at the beginning of that year as your depreciable amount, right? So really what the difference is, is how you arrive at your depreciable amount. So in the case of the, of the diminishing balance method, in the first year, it's only the cost. In the second year, it's the, 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 uh, carrying amount at the beginning of that year in the third year it's also the carrying amount at the beginning of the third year in the fourth year it's the carrying amount at the beginning of the fourth year so in each subsequent year you use the opening balance for your carrying amount which is in other words like like some students mentioned earlier your your cost less accumulated depreciation that gives you the carrying amount you use that to calculate your depreciation on. I hope that answers the question there, CBC, sir. But like I said, we are going to work through those calculations. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. We are going to work through those calculations very thoroughly uh, when the time comes. Okay, now I'd just like you to perhaps make a few notes here because here we we have we have we have discussed it very informally. But I also want you to make the notes a little bit more formally. So, ladies and gentlemen, in, in one of the recordings that I'm going to post here, I actually typed this out on a little word blank word document, but I'll, I will post that to you next week or so once we've gone through the discussions. Maybe we'll still do it in a live class as well. 
Uh, anyway, when it comes to your initial cost, IAS 16 basically determines that there are three factors to it. And we'll discuss those three factors in detail later on, but let's just mention them now. So your cost, your initial cost, when you acquire property, plant and equipment and many other kinds of non-current assets as well, in fact, but we're not discussing them now. We're just focusing on property, plant and equipment. Your cost should include the following three items. First of all, it's purchase price. As you can see in front of you there, the third bullet, it's purchase price. Now, it states they're excluding VAT, but you all know value-added tax now. You have had value-added a few months ago in financial accounting one. So, as you know, it all depends on whether that business is what. If they are what or not. Perhaps you can just type a little word for me. If they are registered a bad vendor that's actually what i was looking for but even registered would have been good registered bad vendor thank you sibu sisu thank you uh pabalelo that is exactly it. thank you uh inati exactly a registered bad vendor if they are a registered bad vendor it means as you know that the vat is not a cost to the business because they can claim it back so if it's a registered VAT vendor, then that is correct. We exclude the VAT from the purchase price because it's not a cost to the business. We claim it back as we've just said, right? But if that business is not, not a registered VAT vendor, then it changes, right? If they are not registered VAT vendors, then it means they have no means of claiming the value added tax back. Then the value added tax actually forms part of the purchase price so just keep that in mind but our default if, if if a question doesn't mention anything we will accept that the business is a registered bad vendor uh, if it isn't then they will specify that then they will certainly tell you that it's not a registered bad vendor to cut the long story short if they are registered if it's a registered bad vendor the, the, the purchase price excludes VAT. It's not a cost to the business. If the business is not a registered VAT vendor, it is a cost to the business because they cannot claim it back. And then the VAT must form part of the purchase price. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, something called directly attributable cost. We're going to discuss that later on, possibly still today. But my very fir first class question, which we're going to do next week, discusses exactly that. What is meant by directly attributable cost? Those of you who want to take notes now already, uh, I can tell you what it, what it means. Uh, it is defined in IAS 1 as any cost that is necessarily incurred. Later on, we're going to look at it again. I'm just saying that those of you who want to know now already what it means, you are welcome to take notes now, but we will discuss it again. So directly attributable cost is any cost that is necessarily incurred. So it must therefore be a necessary cost, right? Uh, to bring the asset, in this case, property, plant and equipment, either to a location, in other words, a place or a condition, in other words, uh, a status where it can be used as management intends, right? What is management intent? If it's vehicles, it is to deliver uh, your merchandise to customers or to go and pick up your raw materials from your suppliers. Uh, or if it's machinery, it is to uh, produce certain products for you. Uh, if it's uh, computers and it's only used for admin purposes, then for administrative purposes, right? Uh, the fact is, uh, it must be it must be a, a necessary cost, and it must either play a significant role in the location or condition of the asset, so it can be used the way that it is supposed to be used. Right? We'll revisit that later. And then, thirdly, uh, I'm just mentioning this now. We're not going to deal with the third aspect in financial accounting two, but uh, sorry, one. But we are 
going to discuss it in financial accounting too. That is what they refer to as certain future costs. Now, what they mean by certain future costs is not some kind of future cost. It is future cost that you are certain is going to happen and you can quantify it up front. For instance, if you build a, a film set or something similar and you know at the end of, of, of the production of that movie, you have to go and dismantle that set again and you know how much it's going to cost you to dismantle it at the end of the film shoot, then you should capitalize that as part of the cost of the asset so that you can write it off over the useful lifetime instead of just writing it off as one major cost at the end. But anyway, that is just for interest sake at this stage. We'll discuss that in more details in financial accounting too. So that is when it comes to initial cost, ladies and gentlemen. When we acquire the asset, we've got to find a way to determine the purchase price, which we will discuss uh, later on. Also, how do we determine whether it's directly attributable cost or not? Because if it does qualify as directly attributable cost, it must be capitalized as part of the cost of this asset. But if it does not qualify as a directly attributable cost, then it must not be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset, but it must rather be written off as an expense. Right. Then we talk about subsequent costs, ladies and gentlemen, some uh, things like day-to-day -day services, any kind of cost that, that occurs after you have actually recorded and recognized the acquisition of the asset. We'll talk about that. Uh, it could include something like the replacement of parts. How do we uh, account for that? We're only going to do that in financial accounting too. I'm just, I'm just uh, throwing out the thoughts. I'm just putting it out there. But we're not going to discuss exactly how we do that in financial accounting one, but next year. Also, certain impairments, which we'll discuss in financial accounting uh, uh, two, as well as financial accounting three. And then we get things like inspections, major inspections and safety certificates. Again, I'm just leaving the thought out there. We're going to discuss it thoroughly in financial accounting two. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is perhaps a good time where we can just pause a little bit and talk about things a little more, a bit more generally than specifically. Property plant and equipment is actually a very interesting topic for a number of reasons. Let us maybe just talk about uh, it from the perspective of when you are an accountant in practice. When you are in an accountant in practice, which asset if you can type for me please ladies and gents which asset or category of assets do you think will have the largest value on the face of your statement of financial position what would you say what category of asset will have the largest value on the face of your statement of financial position In general, it's going to be our property, plant, and equipment, right? So that would include uh, yeah, your tangible, that, says that would include your land, your buildings, your property, your machinery. So the category is property, plant, and equipment, right? It will be under your non-current assets. Under your non-current assets, we'll, we'll see that next time. We get various categories such as property, plant, and equipment, intangible assets, financial assets, uh, biological assets and so forth right but normally that will be the highest value item because it is the highest value item it is also your most risky item when you start with auditing next year auditing two and you'll have uh, internal auditing two next year internal auditing three the year after you'll see that because it is risky, it is, it, is, it is very much exposed to the possibility of theft because it's a tangible item that may be worth a lot uh, or damages for that matter. It has to be protected 
either physically or in some sort of way through access controls, you know, that not everybody can access it, uh, or through locking it up in a, in a motor vehicle in a, in, a, in a storage facility overnight, you've got to protect it. So there are all sorts of considerations that are very important when it comes to property, plant and equipment, because it's susceptible to, 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 to fraud even, or theft, or damages, so it needs to be protected. So there are many factors to take into account from a practical point of view. From an academic point of view, ladies and gentlemen, it's also pervasive. What does pervasive mean? It means it's going to pop up everywhere. You're going to have financial accounting, uh, sorry, you're going to have property, plant and equipment in financial accounting one, which we are doing now, which we've just started today. We are going to continue with financial, uh, sorry, with property, plant and equipment in financial accounting too. I've already indicated there's some aspects that we're going to look at. So we're going to continue with PPE next year. Even in financial accounting three, you are going to start the year with property, plant and equipment. Then you are going to look at impairments. How do you calculate possible impairments of assets? So you're going to have another little, well, another, I think two weeks, in fact, where we are going to take it further. And then ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, when we get to um, uh, 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 general financial reporting four, so that is if you are doing the, the advanced diploma, if you're in your fourth year of studies, you'll have a subject called uh, general financial reporting four. There we are going to, again, revisit property, plant and equipment. There we are going to intensively study the revaluation model. That is what we see in front of us. There are two general models that we can use to measure or to evaluate our property, plant and equipment. The first being the cost model. In other words, you start uh, or, or you normally use the cost which is your purchase price plus the directly attributable cost plus certain future cost as your starting point, and then you depreciate it over its useful lifetime. Then in finan uh, general financial reporting four, we're going to look at the revaluation model. That is where the asset is revalued by a sawn valuator every year, right? So you'll get someone in that's an expert in the field, they will tell you how much that asset is worth at that point in time, which is normally your financial year end, or it could be during the course of a year and then you adapt it or adjust it for the financial year end so that it reflects a very current market value. The reason for that, ladies, and by the way, I just want to emphasize in financial accounting, one, we're going to focus on the cost model. But I just want to give you an example typically of where the revaluation model uh, might come in handy. Ladies and gentlemen, do all, you can just initially type yes or no for me, please. Do all property, plant and equipment items lose value over time? Do they all depreciate? Yes or no? No. Thank you, Sibu Sisu. Thank you, Oweto. Thank you, everyone. Not all of them lose value. Can you perhaps name one or two kinds of items for me that does not lose value, that in fact does not depreciate, they, it appreciates. That's me clapping hands, right? Very happy. You are all spot on, specifically land, sometimes even buildings as well. But property, fixed property such as land, tends to appreciate over time, right? So first of all, you are probably, <laughs> thank you, Lekanyu. So first of all, you're probably not going to provide appreciation on it at all. And secondly, if you just, just over the next 10 years, just use the cost model to evaluate it, it means in 10 years time, you are going to show a grossly undervalued item, right? You might have bought it for, for, for 2 million rands, that piece of property today, but in 10 years' time, it might be worth 
10 million rands or 8 million rands or whatever the case may be. So if you are still going to continue using the cost model for that particular property, it means eventually it's not going to be a fair presentation of the financial position anymore. You are going to understate it. So in a case like property, it will be very appropriate to rather not use the cost model, but the revaluation model. Anyway, I just wanted to, to, to uh, sort of illustrate that. You illustrated for us. You already see the, the reasoning behind that. But then generally all other kinds of, of property, plant and equipment will lose value uh, for as long as you keep on using it. Right. But we are going to focus on the cost model in financial accounting one. In financial accounting two, we're just going to mention again that the revaluation model is, is very appropriate to, to property. And we're going to show some of our properties at the revaluation, revalued amount. Right, ladies and gentlemen, so now we can start looking at depreciation uh, and, the, and, and how do we calculate depreciation. We're not actually going to have uh, uh, enough time today to look at the, the three methods themselves. We are going to do that next time. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, as, we've, as we've seen, your depreciation, that represents the, 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 the usage the usage, your, as a business, your usage of the asset. So at the end of each financial period, when we draw up financial statements, we have to provide our own estimate of what it is worth at the end of the year, right? How do we do that? By means of calculating depreciation. All the depreciations that we have calculated in the first year and the depreciation that we've calculated in the second year that we're using it and the third year and the fourth year, all those periods that we've depreciated it, we are going to accumulate on one specific account for each category of assets. So there may, may be many accounts, but one type of account for each category of property, plant, and equipment. And that set of accounts is called the accumulated depreciation, the accumulated depreciation. So ladies and gents, if I can just perhaps, um, if I can just perhaps ask you a few very, very simple questions here. Uh, if you are going to have a depreciation expense, and you are going to accumulate all the depreciation expenses on various sets of accounts, which we call the accumulated depreciation accounts, but there's more than one. There's one for each category of assets. When it is very high value assets, there might actually be accumulated depreciation accounts for individual assets, such as, such as aircraft, for example, right? Which account, when you record the depreciation, which account will you debit? If you can type that for me, please. Depreciation, thank you, CBC. So in other words, the, the expense itself. But now you're going to accumulate those expenses from the one year to the next on accumulated depreciation accounts. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, those accumulated depreciation accounts should be debited or credited. Okay, Sony, I'm going to answer you just now. So the accumulated depreciation, will you accumulate all those expenses? Would that be debited or credited? If you debit the expense, it has to be credited. Remember, we, we, we're using a balancing double entry system. Then your accumulated depreciation must be credited. Uh, the question up there, what kind of an account is accumulated depreciation? Uh, that's a that's an interesting one. Obviously, the cost of the asset that will be an asset account, right? That will be an asset account. 
your, your accumulated depreciation reduces the cost, right? In order to determine the, the carrying amount there. Thank you, Cebu Sisu. That is exactly the right answer. They, therefore, we refer to as our accumulated depreciation accounts as negative asset accounts. They haven't become liabilities because you don't have to pay your accumulated depreciation back. It's something, it's not something that you need to go and settle and pay for, right? So it is therefore still part of your asset accounts, but it reduces the value, the carrying amount of the asset. So therefore, it is referred to as a negative asset account. Exactly what Cebu Sisu answered there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, therefore, um, we will see in financial accounting too, there are more than two accounts that we need for each kind of asset uh, or each category of assets. But the, the third one, we're only going to address in financial accounting three. I just want you to know that there, there are more. But in financial accounting too, for each category of asset, for each category of asset, we'll need at least two general ledger accounts ladies and gentlemen in one of the recordings and possibly in one of the live classes we'll see how we are going to determine the names of those accounts right but let's talk about it generally for each asset specifically now uh, specifically now property plant and equipment you need at least two general ledger accounts in order to determine its carrying amount. The first kind of ledger account will contain its what? If you can type for me, you can see it in front of me, but I still want to see whether we're on the same page with this. The first kind of account for each category of asset, when I say category of asset, it's like vehicles or machinery or plant or something like that. Lucanio, it becomes a negative asset because it reduces the, the, the cost. In other words, the positive value of the asset. So you need two ledger accounts. You need two ledger accounts which combine. They combine to give you the carrying value or the carrying amount. What does the first account contain? Your first general ledger account, what does it contain? I see we've only got two minutes left. So we'll, the cost, there we go. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, uh, Nsika. Thank you, Cebu Sisu. Kelsey, everyone there. Thank you. So the first, you need an account that contains the cost of the asset. That is the positive asset account, if I can answer Lucania's question there, right? So we need an account which will have, obviously, a debit balance, which will contain the cost that we have recognized when we acquired that item. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we need a second account that will contain what? The what of that category of assets. Thank you, Enrique, again, correct. It's accumulated depreciation, right? So when we acquire the asset, thank you all for those answers. We're going to, to, to recognize it on the debit side of a cost account, we, but we cannot simply call it cost. The way that we've got to create the name of the account We've also got to identify the name of the particular asset or the category of assets. In this example, the category of assets was vehicles. So we'll have vehicles, colon, what does it contain? Cost. And the contra account or the, or the, or the negative asset account will, again, identify the name of the category of property, plant and equipment, in this case, vehicles, colon and then what does that account contain not the cost in this case like Kelsey also said there now it contains the accumulated depreciation right and those two accounts they combine ladies and gentlemen the cost will always obviously exceed the accumulated depreciation of any asset so if you take the cost the balance in the cost account List the balance in the accumulated depreciation account for that category. Once you've calculated it for the year, that will then give you the carrying amount, right? The carrying amount and that amount will be amongst all the other balances for 
uh, other categories that will form part of your property, plant and equipment balance that you're going to disclose on the face of your statement of financial position. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's 5-2. I know that you've got another class at 1 o'clock, so we've got to give you a little bit of a break there. Uh, let me just see, how, where are we now? We are um, almost halfway through, but a lot of the, the rest of this document will be the recordings, right? So you'll enjoy that. That is where we're going to use journal entries to debit the acquisition, the cost, and so forth. But we'll carry on with this document. Uh, it's only 14 pages long. The one for financial accounting too is 42 pages long. Uh, so we'll finish this next time. And then we're also going to start looking at uh, some class questions, right? Some class questions that, that we will discuss from a more practical perspective. So ladies and gents, I don't know if Ms. Morris has got anything to add, but we have run out of time and we do need to give you a little bit of a rest. Uh, no, right. on my end, not. so also got a class now at one. It's all good. Okay, all good. Thank you very much, Miss Morris, oh, yes. for, for, sorry, for sorry, writing. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, sir, before I forget, students, just check. I sent you guys an email yesterday. I also posted it under the announcement. So if you can quickly just jump to there, um, you'll see that the mentors um, and the RO and the School of Accounting Sciences is hosting an event on saturday the 8th at 12 it's online on blackboard um they will it's called the next step so basically they will be talking about um how to deal with your studies as a student post covid uh it's going to be a very interactive session so I please ask that you all join it um there'll be some icebreakers and so forth just to um help don't worry no lecturers it's just the students talking with the students. So it's, I believe that you guys can gain a lot from being in that session. Thank you very much, sir. Just check your email and the link is in the email and under the announcement. It's only for about an hour, hour and a half at most. Okay. Um, there you'll see student support event. There you go. There's the announcement with all the details. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Ms. Morris, for, for that. Yes, I hope to be, to be uh, attending that as well, because it sounds, it looks very exciting to me, I must say. I, I think it is going to be very exciting. I think it's a wonderful initiative by the uh, uh, Student Society as well. Students, thank you so much for attending. Have a lovely afternoon, and we'll see one another next week again, and then we're going to take the notes further, and we're also going to start looking at some of those class questions. Bye-bye.